we'll talk about them fairly soon. You know, one thing about the summer that I have to tell you is you will not believe how quickly the semester passes. All right, I don't know if any of you have taken summer classes before, but it is amazing. So, you know, you look at the due dates now and say, well, the project is due the end of the July, end of July. Well, I got plenty of time. Well, you might not have as much time as you think because it goes by fairly quickly. So, you don't have to worry about it. You don't, you don't need to start working on the project today when you get home, all right? But you should read these documents about the project um, and, uh, and uh, that, will be, that will be useful for you. All right, here is discussions and you can post in here any discussion um, that you have, anything that you want to point out. Feel free to use this to point out um, resources that you find like, hey, we talked about such and such in class. Here's a great web page I found about that. So feel free to use it for that. Feel free to also use it to post questions. Think of this as sort of like outside of class, raising your hand in class and saying something to the whole class. All right, so discussions are something that everyone will see. So if you have something that you think is relevant to the entire class, whether it be an, a nice, interesting bit of information or whether it be um, a, a question that you think the whole class may be interested in. Post it under the discussions. If um, it is something that relates just with you, like you're going to be late with an assignment or whatever, then send that to me a, a, as an email. All right, so an email for something personally related to you, discussion for something you think the whole class would benefit with. Over here you will see there will be grades where you'll see what your grades are in the class. And here's a list of the people in the class. And if you click on me, you should be able to send me a message simply by clicking that. All right. What we're going to do now, now that we have an overview of where the stuff is in Canvas, and again, I went through that fairly quickly, so if you have questions in lab or you need reminded where something is, by all means, you can ask me uh, in lab about that. What we're going to do now is we're going to cover uh, the course materials, the fair use document, um, and the syllabus. And then we'll actually get into the, the content of the class itself. All right, let me leave student view. Let me go here. Let me add back the extensions. All right, let's start out by looking at the fair use handout. Within Canvas, you can either view it this way or you can download it. 
One thing nice about viewing it this way is you get to see the little panda riding the unicycle for a second. And that's, that's always good. All right, but I'm going to download it just to make sure the downloading of it worked without that issue. There we go. Should be okay now. All right. Fair use relates to whether you can take something from the internet and use it in one of your projects. Now, know that given the fact that we're in an educational environment, the law is different for us than it is for the rest of the world. So for example, let's say I was making a sporting goods store, all right? And I found a great picture of LeBron James wearing Nikes and I wanted to include that on my website. If I was making a sporting goods store and I did that, that would be against the law. All right? I don't own the copyright of that image. You know? Presumably Nike or the Cleveland Cavaliers or LeBron James or the NBA or someone else owns the co uh, copyright to that. Unless I got permission from them, it would be illegal for me to use that. It actually, believe it or not, would be illegal for me to use that if I was doing a Cleveland Cavaliers fan site. Even if I wasn't making any money off of it, it would, strictly speaking, be illegal for me to use that without getting permission from the copyright holder. In an educational environment, they cut us a little bit of slack by what is called fair use. We can use things provided that we follow some guidelines and for the most part what the guidelines are is don't use too much and give credit where you got it from. So if for your final project you decide to do a project about the Cavaliers winning the NBA championship and you find a picture of LeBron James on the Cav web, website and you want to include that, it's legal for you to include it in your project as long as you don't take too many images there's no more than five by an artist, all right? And you give credit and say, hey, I got this, I got a picture of LeBron James from Cleveland Cavaliers website. You can put that somewhere on the page or have a credits page where you post that information or whatever. Um, one thing I think is important to do is to respect the copyright law. Um, I know that some of you might say, well, people do this all the time. People take pictures from places and post them on Facebook or Tumblr or whatever all the time without getting permission. Yeah, that doesn't mean it's legal. That doesn't mean that the FBI is going to come knocking at your door if you post a picture of LeBron James to Tumblr. All right, it's a law that isn't necessarily enforced to a great degree. But we do want to make sure that we do things by the book here in this class. All right. So. I want to keep this in mind for all our assignments. We want to obey copyright law. And in, in a nutshell, it's no different than if you were writing a term paper, right? If you're writing a term paper and you quoted a book, all right, you would put a footnote or a, a, an entry in the bibliography or whatever saying, I got this information from such and such book, all right? Otherwise, you've committed plagiarism. You've, you've, put, you've passed off someone else's words as your own. All right. Well, it's sort of the same thing. If you use a picture from some other site and you didn't take the picture, you should put a credit uh, on the page saying, I got this picture from clevelandcavaliers.com or mba.com or whatever. All right. So let's just remember that as we go through the, the semester. All right. Syllabus.
not letting me rename it. Oh, there we go. Let me change these to DOSX as well. All right, here we go. Yes, it is a doc file. There we go. All right. Top part is identifying information for me. Um, my office is upstairs in the business building. Although typically during the summer I do not have um, regular office hours. That being said, I'm on campus fairly regularly over the summer. So I can make time to see you if you have questions and you can address the questions in lab. All right. The way this class is structured is we have a lecture for the first half. So from 9 till 1040, we have a lecture. From 1040 to 1225? Yeah, that sounds about right. We have lab. All right. And the lab is your time to work on the assignments. So typically, if students have questions, they ask me in lab. All right. Um, you can also ask me questions during lecture. All right. You can ask questions via the discussion board. You can email me questions. If none of those things work and you need additional help, that's fine. Talk to me and we'll arrange to have office hours to address your questions. I included my phone number, but it's probably best to contact me via email as opposed to via phone. I check my email way more often than I check my phone messages. So it's probably better to send me an email if you need to contact me. But there is my phone number in case you are somewhere and you can't get to your email or whatever. You can send me email either through Canvas or you can send me email through regular LC email, in which case there is my email address. Here's a description of the class. Outcomes. These ought to be more than just uh, pretty language. You know, we have to come up with these when we create a course and when we change a course. And we actually spend a fair amount of time coming up um, with these. These should be our focus, really. These are the reasons that we're here. All right? And it should be obvious, the stuff that I'm covering, how it corresponds with these outcomes. But if it doesn't, you're allowed to ask me, what does this have to do with the class? You know, I might go off on a tangent. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with the class. Maybe I'm just talkative that day. All right? But if it does have something to do with the class, I need to make sure you understand why what I'm talking about is relevant. And we can use these outcomes sort of as a guide to focus our thinking about the class. Here is our textbook. All work will be turned in via Angel. No, it won't. It will be turned in via Canvas. All right. You do need some kind of storage medium, this is like a thumb drive, or store it up part of a Dropbox account, or email it to yourself, or whatever. Because um, the computers in our labs, every time they're rebooted, they refresh themselves, they reset themselves. All right? And 
therefore, if you worked on something today, even if you went to the exact same spot, it wouldn't be there when you came back on Thursday. So whatever you work on, take a copy of it. And again, worst case scenario, just email it to yourself, right? Um, and you should be okay. Instructor approach. This is your class. All right. If you look around, there's, I don't know, a dozen or so people in here, give or take. That's a relatively small class. Um, if you have a, a question, um, there's a good chance that there's other people in the class that have the same question. So if you didn't understand something I said, there's probably two, maybe one or two of your classmates that also don't understand what I said. So in a class with 12, three students that don't understand something is a quarter of the class. All right? So by all means, ask. The absolute worst I will do, I guarantee you, is I'll say, can we talk about this in lab? If you ask me a question maybe that's very specific to a problem that you're running into or your project. The worst I'll do is, well, let's, let's talk about this in lab. Or if you ask a question that's maybe a little off topic, I'll say, well, let's talk about that in lab. But by all means, don't let that stop you from asking the question. All right? Here's a list of some college policies that I'm not going to read to you, but you should read. Late work. I have a, I have a different policy about late work. I reserve the right to deduct for late work but I also reserve the right not to deduct for late work. All right? In other words, if you're someone that I see is coming to class, and I see you in lab, and I see you working on assignment, and you're just having, you're struggling with one piece of the assignment, and you're talking to me about it, and for whatever reason, you end up turning it in late, I probably won't deduct at all for late work. All right? I may assign something that's due on Tuesday. What do I care if you're working on it hard and you turn it in on Wednesday? Or maybe you're not feeling well and you miss class and that puts you a little bit behind. All right. Remember, missing one class in the summer is like missing a week in a full semester, full length semester. So if you're sick a week or you have something come up for a week or whatever, um, and you're late with assignment, and you're communicating with me about it, that's okay. I don't need to know personal details, but just drop me a line and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling well. I might be late with this assignment. Where I choose to deduct is students that simply disappear. I don't see them working on it in lab. They're not asking me questions about it. They may or may not be attending class, but I don't see them really participating. And then, all of a sudden, week four, they start trickling in, turning in week one's assignment and week two's assignment and so on. There, I feel no problem deducting. The bottom line is, is as long as I see that you're putting forth the effort and you're keeping me in the loop and communicating with me, then I'm more than happy to accept assignments that are late and, and, and not deduct points. Now, the one thing I will say is if you're late with one assignment, no big deal. If you find yourself in a pattern where you're late with an assignment, then you're late with the next assignment, then you're late or maybe even later with the following assignment, that's a sign that you need to take some action. Now, that action might be, well, I need to knuckle down and spend a little bit more time in this class. All right. Or it might be I need to talk to me and, and get some assistance or whatever. So one late assignment, not bad. Multiple late assignments, even if I don't deduct, is a sign to you that something needs to change so that you get back on track. All right?
grade will be based on the following. Homework, 60 points. There'll be six 10-point assignments. Sort of one a week. All right. There'll be a project design, which is the plan for the project that you're going to create. And there'll be the finished project. And that'll add up to 100 points. And 90 to 100 is a day, and so on down the line. Here is approximately the schedule that we're going to follow, along with the assignments that are due. So week one, we're going to cover the course introduction, which we're doing right now. We're going to cover chapters one through three. There are no assignments due next week. Oh, I'm sorry, this week. All right, the assignment that I made this week is due next week. And that's typically how it's going to go. I assign it one week, it's due the following week. So lab one, which I assign this week, is actually due next week, a week from today. 6, 16. And so on down the line. The project design is due 7, 14. And then finally, the last week, you have two things due. Lab 6 is due on 7.28, and the final project is due on 7.30. All right? So that's the schedule of the stuff that you have to do. And peace. Questions? All right. All right. Okay. We're going to talk about web pages and the kind of stuff that's on web pages. And then we'll get into the basics of making a web page. That's what we'll do today. Probably by the end of class, we'll come back around and we'll talk about um, your first lab assignment. Let's imagine that this is your textbook. All right. So let's imagine this is your textbook. All right. There's content in your textbook. All right. Now, web pages have different kinds of content than textbooks do, but there's some things that are in common, right? Textbooks can have images. Web pages can have images. Textbooks have text. Web pages have text. Now, if we notice here, some of the text looks different than the other text. This text is sort of a type page. This is a spread page. This text is a headline for an article. And we have a text. This text is a caption for the picture. Again, headline, byline, image, caption. And then we have a whole mess of stuff going on down here. Now, in other words, there's two things on the, on the page. There is content, and then there is the way the content looks. In other words, this is a word up here, sports. 
And this is a word here, Lorraine. But they look a lot different. Why do they look different? Why does the word sports on the top look different than the word Lorraine down here in the article? Pardon me? Identification. Identification of what? Significance. All right. Anyone want to add to that? Well, the means by look different. All right. I guess my question is, is why is it different? Why isn't everything in the same, having the same font and size? Yes. Exactly. So we can differentiate between the meaning of these different things. All right. On web pages, you have the same thing. If we look at this. We have Lorain County Community College looking one way here, web development looking one way, summer 2015 looking a different way. They're all text, but their appearance gives you some sort of idea, the significance, how to interpret it, all right, and so on. Now, let's get back to the textbook example. Let's imagine that this is our textbook, and I say the first paragraph in this article is important, and it's going to be on the final exam. Now, if you're the kind of person that highlights, right, you might go and you might highlight that, and you might even put a star next to it, indicating that it's important. All right? If I say, for example, this down here isn't very important, we're not going to cover it, you might put a big X to it in the textbook. All right. If something maybe is interesting to you, maybe you'll highlight it a different way. I've seen people use different color highlighters that mean different things. All right, if they're really into it. All right. Again, what are we doing here? We're giving additional meaning to the text. We're saying that the text up here isn't equal to the text down here. All right. Why isn't it equal? Well, because this is important and this is something that we're not interested in. It's not going to be on the test or it's out of date or whatever. All right. So, web pages contain text and they contain images and so on, but we convey to the viewer additional meaning about the text in a certain way. So again, if we go to a website, ESPN, let's say, and we look at this, we can see favorites, ESPN, a Cleveland doubleheader, third line. All these things look different because they have a different significance. They have a different meaning. All right. This is sort of like sports was in the newspaper. It's a heading. All right. It's different than the other words on the page. This paragraph is simply, you know, an introductory paragraph to an article. All right, so it looks a certain way, and so on. So what we need to do in our coding is we need to tell the user not just the content of the page, not just the word of the page. We're going to start, start out focusing on text. All right, but in addition to the actual text and the actual words that we want to say, we want to give the user some indication of what that text means. All right. What's the significance of it? And how do we do that in HTML? Maybe some of you have some HTML experience before. How do we indicate what something means, what the significance of a word is? Via a tag. Exactly. So in the case of a textbook, we sort of, right? We sort of put different 
indications on what, what's not important. You know, we literally mark up our textbook. Well, in web design, web development, we use a language called HTML, which stands for what? Hypertext markup language. Let's break this down. Hypertext. What does hypertext mean? Nonlinear? Okay. Jump around? All right. What does someone is hyperactive? What does that mean? If I say, boy, that person is hyperactive. They have a lot of energy. In other words, they're more active than normal. Right? They're more active than typical, I'll say, as opposed to normal. Normal is a loaded word. All right? they're, more tip they're more active than average or typical. So hypertext, in essence, means we have more than text here. It's not just like a plain page of text typed out. It's more than text. In other words, we can have images. We can have video. We can have audio. We can have links to other pages. So the first part of HTML, hypertext markup language, means that our web pages are going to contain more than just plain old text. All right, more than just plain old text. The last part, markup language, indicates how we tell anyone viewing that web page what the content on our page represents, what the significance of it is. And markup language, another way of saying mark markup language, is the use of tags. All right. In HTML, we use tags to indicate what something means. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create a very simple web page. Again, our first examples are going to be text only. All right. But our text is going to mean different things. In other words, every word on the page isn't going to be equal. Some of it is going to be headlines. Some of it is going to be headers and so on. And in some, this is going to be a plain old paragraph of data. All right. Let's say I wanted to do a web page about El Lorain County Community College's web development program. And I want to make a web page about the different courses that we offer. All right. So, <clears throat> I might start by sketching it out. One thing that's important to understand is that web development, the process of web development, has really two aspects. The technical aspect of like what coding we use to make the page look like the, the way we want it to. But it also has a design aspect. And the design aspect isn't just about like, gee, I want to make sure I pick pretty colors. The design aspect is about how I'm going to structure the information so that people can understand it. In other words, if I simply had a gigantic block of text, all right, this is El Lorain County Community College's web development program. Um, there are several courses in the program. The first course is CISS 216. And if it went like that for 500 words of just a solid block of text, it would be very difficult for the user to understand and to, to, to be able to get the, out of the page what they wanted easily. So we think about how we're going to organize a page. And even though we're not going to do anything fancy with this, that is design. So throughout this course, we're going, to, we're going to look both at the technical aspect of web design and the design aspect. So I might do something like this, sketching out that as Lorraine Community College. Underneath that, a bit small. A 
understand that this is associated with LC. You know, this isn't Cuyahoga Community College's web development program or Cleveland State's or whatever. This is ours. And it's not a program. It's our web development program. So I'm going to put those as headers at the top of the page. So right off the bat, as soon as that page loads, the user can't possibly mistake this for something else. If I had a big giant block of text, the user would have to go through and read to figure out what was going on. There's a good book about web development or web design, and it's in our library, and it's titled Don't Make Me Think. All right? And it's not meant to be insulting. The idea is, is your job as a designer is to make your content as clear as possible. So people don't, if, if people get faced with a page, they don't have to sit there wondering, well, what is this page about? This is right in their face, and they see what it is very clearly. All right. I'm Maybe I'll change that to say web development courses. Then I'll have a paragraph. Then CI 216, web development. And, then I'll and so this is the design process. And again, it's very simplistic in this case because we haven't learned a lot of the tools yet. All right? But the point is, is we spend some time thinking about it and documenting and planning what we're going to do before we do it. All right? Because well-designed web pages don't happen accidentally. You're not going to go shoot from the hip and just come up with a, a wonderful looking page. Any more than creating a good term paper in English. Right? You know, most people don't simply sit down and bang out a term paper. Or let me rephrase that. Most people that write good term papers don't sit down and just bang out a term paper. They take some time and make an outline. They think about it and so on and so forth. They organize their thoughts and so on. In fact, this here almost looks like an outline, right? So again, effectively we're doing the same thing. So that's our little mini design for this page, all right? Now let's actually go and make the page. All right, I'm going to use just plain old notepad to make my web page. All right, the reason why I do that is because there are software, there is software available that help you make web pages, that do a lot of stuff for you. Uh, Dreamweaver is a famous one, Visual Studio, and so on. We want to understand web pages on their nuts and bolts level, all right? Therefore, we're going to do everything by hand. It'd be like if you're going to school to be a pastry chef, right? If you're going to school to be a pastry chef and you had to bake a cake for your assignment for this week, you wouldn't go to Giant Eagle and buy a Betty Crocker cake and bake it and turn it in, right? Betty Crocker did the work. You didn't. You didn't learn anything about baking cakes, really. All right? You would bake it from scratch, and you would get all the ingredients, and you'd start at ground zero and bake it from scratch. And if you did that, all right, you would learn about baking a cake. So for that reason, we're going to use Notepad. Notepad is like baking a cake from scratch. We're going to do everything ourselves. Now, if you use a different, uh, if you use a, a, a Mac, for example, there is not Notepad, but there's other applications similar. Um, also on Windows, even, there's something called Notepad++ that you can use, that, that some people like to use, whatever. The reason I pick Notepad is every Windows machine has Notepad on it. So if you have a Windows machine, you got Notepad. All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to start up Notepad. I'm going to make the font bigger so that you can see what I'm typing here. The reason I'm using Notepad again is unlike Word or WordPad or anything else, this just 
is the plain text, the, the content of the web page, without any special formatting. All right, we're going to do all the formatting via the tags. All right, the first thing that we're going to put on the page is actually not a tag. It's called a, a, a type declaration, a document type. All right, and it looks like this. Oops. Doc type HTML. So this is the less than sign, exclamation point, the word doc type, a space, HTML, and then the greater than sign. That tells the web browser what kind of document it's dealing with. Specifically, this tells a web browser that it is dealing with an HTML5 document. All right. Web browsers can actually handle a lot of different documents. Earlier versions of HTML and so on. This sort of helps the browser out by explaining to it, hey, this document is in HTML5, so I know how to handle it a little bit better. All right. Keep in mind that we create our web pages using a tool such as Notepad or whatever. But when people actually view our pages, when they're up on the internet and people view them, they're going to use a web browser to view them. So what we're seeing now is sort of the x-ray of the page. This is the guts of the page. All right? This is the inner workings of the page. When we save it, we're going to view it using our web browser, and then we'll see how the rest of the world's going to see it. Now, one thing to keep in mind, an important notion, is that we're going to look at one file. There's only going to be one file in our example today. All right? But we're going to look at it two different ways. We're going to look at it through Notepad, which is the innards of it. We're also going to look at it through a web browser, which is the surface of it. It's just like if you took a photograph of me and took an x-ray of me. There's still only one me. Right? It isn't like there's a skeleton me that's running around somewhere and a skin me that's running around somewhere. It's one me. It's just two different ways of looking at that person in this case. Same thing with the web page. We're only making one file. We're only making one web page. But we're going to look at it in the inside and we're going to look at it from the surface. All right. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start creating tags. Now, I'm going to leave some blank space as I, cre as I create the tags. I'm going to put some things in them. All right, I'll fill in the blank spaces later. All right. But we'll talk about tags as we're doing it. There's a few tags that appear on every single web page, or ought to appear on every single web page. There's an HTML tag. I'm going to leave some spaces, and then I'm going to put this. Maybe. Tags come in pairs. They're like the animals on Noah's Ark. There's two of each. So whenever I have a tag, I have this, and I have this. The, the tag that looks like this is called the starting tag. The tag that looks like this is the ending tag. All right. What this says is that, hey, I have some HTML code here. And my HTML code is going to be the stuff between here and here. So all my HTML code is going to go between the starting and ending tag. So the starting and ending tag sort of form bookends. They show sort of containment. The stuff that's my HTML page is between here and here. All right. So 
the HTML page itself consists of a head portion. and a body portion. All right. So if I'm looking at this, contained in my HTML page is a head section and a body section. The head and body are both part of the HTML page because they're between the start and end tag. So they're part of the HTML page. Now the head isn't part of the body and the body isn't part of the head, right? Because they don't overlap. The head is outside of the body and the body is outside of the head. All right? These are two tags that will appear on every one of your web pages, a head and a body, in addition to an HTML tag. These are for sort of like the skeleton. Every web, web page is going to have at least this stuff, and then it's going to have some other stuff as well. Now notice that I've indented these things. So I put the HTML tag all the way over to the left. I indented the head. I indented the body. I am doing that for my own benefit. The web browser doesn't care about indentation or spaces or anything like that. That's called white space. Within a web page, the browser disregards any white space. All right, doesn't care about it. And at first, that may seem confusing. A lot of times when students start this, they put extra spaces in thinking that they're going to see extra spaces in the browser. This is actually a good thing because this allows us to format our page in a way that's easy for us to read. One of the goals of developing a web page is not just to get the job done and to develop a web page, but to develop a web page that's easy to go back and change. All right. Why is that? Well, because that's just the way the world is. All right? Stuff changes. Therefore, almost everything that we do in web development, we're doing not just to get the job done, but to how to make our life easier in the future. So by indenting these tags, it makes it easier to read. We could literally type every tag on one line and the browser would get it if we did it correctly. However, if we went back and tried to figure out how to change something, it would be a nightmare. So by putting these extra spaces in, it simply makes the pages easier to read and allows us to make it easier to change. Right now, I'm going to talk about one tag that belongs in the head section, and that is the title. All right? The title is what appears up here in the tab. Lorain County Community College, home. That's the title. So if we minimize this and we put our mouse over it, the title pops up in this version of Windows. So it's good to have a descriptive title. That way users know which is your page. All right. The title doesn't appear anywhere in the screen other than up here on the title bar and on the tab. Everything that's displayed here is contained in the body. All right is contained in the body. So, we get back to our design. We 
we want it to look like this. I'm going to start off doing it wrong, okay? And then I'm going to go back in and correct it, all right? So I'm telling you this on purpose so you don't think that maybe I'm rusty from the spring semester and the break and being off for three weeks or whatever and I'm having a bad morning, all right? So I'm telling you in advance I'm going to do it wrong, all right? That way you won't be surprised when it doesn't work out right. All right, so I'm going to go in. And I'm going to type in the words that we want to appear. Lorraine County Community College. Web Development Courses. CISS 215. All right, we'll go and put my second paragraph in here. All right, so let's imagine I typed in complete paragraphs here. So if I look at this, this is a text that's in the body, so this is a text that's going to appear on my page. What I want to do now is I want to save the page as an HTML document and open it up in the browser. Again, remember the two views of the same file. So I'm going to go up here, I'm going to say File, Save. Now here's where it's a little tricky. We have to change it from where it says save as type text documents to all files. Because we're not going to save it with a .txt extension. All right? We were talking a little bit about file extensions earlier. File extensions tell the operating system, etc., what kind of file it is. We don't want to store this as a text file, as a TXT file. We want to store it as an HTML file. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to type in first page dot HTML. And I'm going to save it on the desktop. All right. So I click save and there you go. It saves it on a desktop. Now, if we look at it, notice that it has a little blue Internet Explorer icon. That means that Windows recognizes that this is an HTML page. All right. Now, one thing. Notice we don't see .html there. All right. That's because for convenience sake, typically file extensions are turned off on many computers. That's okay for just ordinary users. All right? They don't need to know that a word file ends in .doc or .docx or whatever. But when we start developing our pages, we need to know the precise complete file name including the extensions. We're going to need to know that when we create links, we're going to need to know that when we use images. So, I suggest everyone go in and it's different for each version of Windows, but somewhere in your, in your Windows there's a folder in search options you can click on. Click on the middle tab for view and then turn off this setting that says hide 
extensions for known file types. So now we see the complete file name, first page.html. And that's useful just to make sure that we've done it right. If, if you mistyped it and your page doesn't open up in a browser, now you can go and rename it and give it the proper extension. So now let's go look at this page in the browser. So I'm going to double click it. It's going to open up in Internet Explorer and it gives me nothing that looks at all like what I wanted. Right? So, here is a view that everyone in the world is going to see when they go to your web page. Here is your view as a developer of making the web page. Remember, only one file. Both of these are first page.html. Just so we're looking at it from a br in a browser, looking at it in Notepad. Photograph, x-ray. Now, why didn't this work to give us a page that I wanted something like that? Why is this page not looking like this at all? Why is it just a jumble of text? Not formatted. I didn't tell the browser the significance of each piece of text. I just had plain text. Nowhere in there did I say that this is meant to be the top heading. This is meant to be the second heading. This is meant to be the third heading. This is just a plain paragraph. All right? So therefore, the browser, remember the browser ignores white space. So the browser doesn't matter if these are on different lines. It browse, it, the browser just combines everything together on one line and formats them all identically. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add the formatting. Well, how do we add the formatting? in HTML via tags. All right. So tags tell the browser what things represent. So we have LCC's web development classes in the title. If we look at our page, that's what it says up there in the title. So that worked. All right. But we didn't define what any of these other things represent. And therefore, the page doesn't look like the way that we expected it to. So I have to put the tags in. So first tag we're going to use is an H1 tag. And H1 stands for heading and a top level heading, first level heading, H1. Heading 1. What does that mean? That means if it were an outline, it would be like at the top of the outline. All right. You know, if you're thinking about this, if we were writing a term paper about LC's web development classes, we might write the outline. CISS 216. So, this is a thing in our outline. This is a second heading. These two are third. If we were going to expand this page to talk about networking classes, let's say, or software development classes, we might be networking. And then have there. So each of these are on the same level. So each of these would be second level things. All right. So we have in HTML up to six levels of headings. Not six headings, mind you, but six level of headings. I could have as many of each level of heading as I need. So for example, this is an H1, that's the top level heading. I'm going to make this a second level heading. I could have 
10 different H2s, right, if I add web development, networking, software development, mobile development, and so on. I'm going to go and finish this up. And this should look closer to what we wanted. The P tag indicates it's simply a paragraph of text. No special significance to it. So just like in the newspaper, we have and then we just have a story here. You know, this is a heading, this is just a plain old paragraph. That should be an H3, um, my mistake. No, H3. Remember the H, and, and that's, a, that's a common thing that confuses some people. H4 doesn't, this doesn't mean that it's the third heading, it means it's the third level heading. All right, so it's not that the first heading is H1, the second is H2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It corresponds to the level of heading. So this is the top level, so this gets to be an H1. This is the second level, so it gets to be an H2. These two are both on the third level of our outline, so those are both H3s. All right? So again, you could have as many H3s as you want. Now, you have up to six levels of heading. And you might say to yourself, well, what happens if I have more than that? If you have more than that, then your page might be too complicated. Because if you've ever written outlines for a term paper, I bet you've never gone more than six levels deep in an outline. All right? Because that would be really confusing. All right? If you really have to go more levels than that, then maybe you need to rethink your topic and, and, and break it down a little bit more. Or in the case of web page development, maybe you need to reorganize and put things on different pages or whatever. All right? And then finally, here's our paragraph. Now normally what I do when I'm developing a web page is I have it open both in the browser and in Notepad. So I'm viewing the essay as I'm looking at the photograph of the person. And I go back and forth. So I will go and save this. Whoops, yeah. I'll go and save it. And then I'll simply come here. No, not there. Here. And I'll hit refresh. All right. Now we're looking a little bit more like we intended it to look. All right? Now notice, H1 is the biggest. H2 is the second biggest. H3 is the third biggest. And then our regular paragraphs are normal size font. That's the default of the browser. Typically, Humans, when they see things, they tend to give more importance to bigger things than smaller things. So if you have giant words on a page and tiny words on the page, you're liable to think that the giant words on the page are more important than the tiny words. It's funny because if you ask a kid to draw a picture of their family, very often, even if they're a three-year-old, all right, they will be as big as everyone else, <laughs> all right? Why? Is it because they are not good artists? No. It's because they're the most important person in the world to themselves, just as it should be, right? So therefore, importance is associated in human brains often with size, and it's the same idea here. Now this is the default. Later on in the course, we're going to learn in CSS how we could change that. Maybe we don't, for example, 
want H1s to be bigger than H2, but maybe to be in a different font, all right, or a different color, or something like that. Later on, we'll learn that the way your page look depends on the default behavior of the HTML, as well as any CSS that you put in. Now, one thing that I would say is if you look at this and you say, wow, that Lorain County Community College is way too big. I should make it an H3 instead and make this an H4 and these H5. No, you don't do it that way. You do it based on conceptually where it fits in on an outline. All right, that's a top level heading, so it should be an H1. If it's too big, be patient with me for a week or so, and we'll study the CSS on how to make it smaller. But for now, don't make things different sizes, or, or don't use different tags other than the ones you ought to, to simply get the look that you're going after and get the size that you're going after. All right, that's lying to your browser. All right, and telling it it's one kind of thing when it's really something else. So, what's the difference between what we had before and now? Is that we've tagged our text. We've put that text within tags, and now the browser knows the significance of that text. So it can display it differently. All right. So. What is your first assignment? All right. Your first assignment, let's go back into not angel. I'm going to go to angel because I can't remember the URL. Your first assignment is to and research these three topics, HTML, HTML5, CSS. All right. Create a web page that has an article about each of these topics. All right. We actually have not talked about the article tag yet. You simply use an article tag to group stuff on a page. So I could have gone in and put an article tag here and there. We'll talk more about these tags um, next time. So your page will have three articles, HTML, HTML5, CSS. Research these. Find out what they are. Find out what's important about them. All right. Write a well-written paragraph about each of them and create a web page that contains that. Now, my suggestion would be first to design that page. Now again, we're not going to go, we haven't covered like how to make things different colors or how to lay out things differently or whatever. So your design is going to be pretty simple. It's going to look pretty much.
But I would say that there's probably a few different ways that you could organize the content of this stuff. All right? You could do it a couple of different ways. So spend a little bit of time thinking about how you want it to look that way. Do the research and then go and create the web page. When you're done with the web page, upload it here to Canvas. Now, what my suggestion would be, would be for you to spend your time in lab doing one of two things. All right? Or maybe if you have time, even both. One of the two things would be to look at and investigate and do some research to familiarize yourself with these topics. What they are, what they're for, what they mean, and so on. So that you can write your paragraph. You could write your paragraph in Word today, for example, even if you don't want to, even if you're a little confused about the uh, creating HTML tags, you could write your paragraphs in Word and then simply copy and paste them into your HTML when you're ready. The other thing I would suggest you to do is try to recreate what I did here today with my simple web page with some other topic, maybe a page about yourself. You know, and have a heading of uh, that's your name, and then have different eight different sections of the page that relate to different hobbies that you have, or or whatever. All right. So the lab, you know, when you think about labs, you know, in science, it's a place to experiment. All right. So use the lab time to experiment and to play around with the stuff that we've learned, because um, that will reinforce the learning. And if you do a simple example of that, once you've done the research, you can go in and you should have no problem completing the first lab assignment. Are there any questions at this point? The lab is right down the hall in BU 102. It will remain there even on Thursday. Remember, Thursday we are meeting in UC 309. Okay, and we will meet there the remainder of the semester as near as I know. All right. So if there are no questions, we'll go to lab.